There are two basic ways to control the shading on your models. You can model in extra edge loops and bevels, or you can use a combination of UV and smoothing splits. There are pros and cons to both methods, and ideally you should be using a combination of both of them on your models, depending on which one's more efficient. So I'm going to start with uh, UV and smoothing splits, and as you can see on the screen I've got these geospheres again, but this time they are both set up with tangent space normal maps, but with different setups for models and UVs. So if you look, the topology is actually the same, uh, but the model on the left is 107 verts and the model on the right is 540 verts. However, if you were to ask the 3D program what the vertex count of one of these spheres is, it would say it has 96 verts. And the difference is because of how I'm using splits. So if I switch to a basic shader with no normal map, you'll see that the model on the left is fully smoothed while the model on the right has all hard edges, or if you're a max user, each triangle is on its own smoothing group. So what's happening here with this model is that at each one of these hard edges, the model is getting split. So that means that at each one of these intersections, there's actually six vertices instead of one, and that's to support all six of these triangles individually. So for artists, what this means is that you need to be aware of how your splits increase the vertex count of your models. So in this example, the model on the right is actually five times less vertex efficient than the model on the left, and it's not something you're going to be able to see easily in your 3D package's triangle vertex count. So as I mentioned, if you were to ask 3ds Max what the vertex count of both of these models was, it would say that both of them have 96 verts, but this model on the left, even though it's fully smoothed, actually has 107. And that's because of the UV layout and the UV splits. So UV splits work essentially the same way as smoothing splits, except with UV coordinates. So if you see this green edge running around the center of our geosphere. This is a UV border edge. So I've mapped this geosphere into two uh, relaxed planar maps. And everywhere along this edge, it has to double the verts. It's treating the model as two separate shells. So in this case, it's adding an extra vert at each one of these uh, intersections. So you can see if I go to the UV layout, and get a better idea of what's happening. So at the border edges here on each side, it's having to treat these essentially as two separate objects and double up the number of verts. And that's what accounts for the difference between the 96 vertex count and the 107. So an easy way to visualize that split is if I select one of these verts on the border edge here on the model, the UV editor actually selects two different verts in the UV layout, and that's because there's double verts along all these edges in order to support these UVs. So the model on the right has splits from the smoothing, and the model on the left has splits from the UVs. But if you were to take this same model on the left and break all the smoothing, so now that it has all the same smoothing splits as the other model, the vertex count would go up to 540 just like the other model, even though it has those UV splits. So the splits don't stack, meaning that if you have a UV split in place, you can add a smoothing split, and it's not going to increase the vertex count further. Once the geometry has been split, it's been split. So another example is if you were to take this model on the right with all the smoothing splits and look at the UV sheet, I've actually got each of these triangles mapped separately to its own plane. So what that means is that even if you were to take this model and smooth it, the vertex count isn't going to change. It's going to stay at 540 because it's already got all those splits on it from the UV information as well. For artists, this is really useful because by necessity, all models will have some UV splits. And that means that there are some areas of the models that you can add hard edges without affecting the vertex count. So there's really only one rule you have to follow when you're working with smoothing and UV splits, and that's if you have a smoothing split in place, you have to have a UV split with padding. I'm going to load up a sample scene to show an example. So in this scene, we've got two cubes. Um, both of them are unsmoothed, but they have different UV layouts. So you can see this is the green border edges. Um, on this cube on the right, each face is mapped separately with padding, and on this one on the left, everything is stitched into a cross, and I'll show you what that looks like. So cube on the left on the bottom here is one island. Cube on the right is separate islands for each face. So now if I turn on the normal map, you can see the reason why you need to do this. So if you look at these two models, uh, the one on the right looks clean. Um, all the surfaces blend together correctly. And what I baked from the high poly for this was a little chamfer uh, to better show this off. But uh, this looks correct. But if you zoom in on the one on the left, you can see that there's these artifacts at all these edges. And the reason why these artifacts are happening is because it's attempting to take the pixel colors on either side of the shell, which are very different pixel colors for the normal map, and it's trying to blend them across this edge. And because there's no padding, uh, the wrong color is bleeding across the surface and creating the wrong normal orientation. So you can load up the UV editor again, and you can see the texture sheet overlaid on top of the wires. So you can see here's two edges that are stitched, and on either side, one side is pink and one side is dark blue. And there's just this line in the middle. And the mesh is floating point, so there's sort of an infinite amount of precision, whereas this is raster, so there's only an amount of precision of the pixels. And then once it gets texture filtered, um, some of these colors bleed over the other side, and that's what creates that error. Whereas on this model, you can see the shells are separated, and they're padded. So in the bake, it's extending these colors out further, um, and then when the textures get interpolated, 
it's just blending with more of the color it needs on either side. So to clarify this rule, um, if you have a smoothing split, you have to have a UV split with padding. However, it doesn't work the other way. So if you have a UV split, you don't necessarily need to put a hard edge or a smoothing split in that place. So an example of this would be if you think of a sphere mapped onto two islands, uh, you wouldn't really want to have a smoothing split running down the middle of a sphere just because you had a UV split. So what that means is that you need to use some amount of common sense in how you're applying your smoothing, uh, but the only rule you really need to follow is that if you have a smoothing split, you have to have a UV split. So I'm going to switch over to a more practical example of how a model gets set up in different ways to control shooting behavior. Okay, so for this example, I've got the plane iron from the hand plane model, but baked three different ways with different low poly setups. So on the left is the most vertex efficient, and this is every UV shell that I could stitch together is stitched, and there are no hard edges on the model anywhere. Whereas the model on the right is the opposite. It's got a couple extra UV splits, and it's got hard edges wherever possible. The model in the middle also has every shell stitched that I could, and uh, it's got uh, no smoothing splits either, but I've added some extra supporting loops to help control the shading behavior. So right now these all look equally good, and that's because we're rendering them with a uh, perfectly matched shader and bake. So this was baked for 3ds Max, and it's being displayed in a 3ds Max shader that's set up correctly. So if I switch over to a material that uh, doesn't have a normal map on it, you can see the model on the left has all these really intense artifacts, and the only reason it looks good is because everything's set up perfectly. Uh, the model in the middle and the model on the right are both quite a bit cleaner. And if you look at the topology, it's because I've added an edge loop uh, on each side here and a ring of edges around this hole, uh, some edges in the back, and some edges at the top. Whereas uh, this model on the right has the same topology as the model on the left, but I've added a couple of smoothing splits uh, along with UV splits for areas like this face on the side. Um, the back is separately mapped to make a sharp edge here and this ring of faces in the center is separately mapped so they can be on a sharp edge. So if you take a look, there's three different vertex counts. Least efficient is in the middle, uh, most efficient is on the left, and the middle option is on the right. Now, uh, if you have a perfectly synced workflow, you certainly can do this version on the left, which is the most efficient, but there are drawbacks to it. So if I uh, reapply the normal map, and I just load up a lower res version, here's an example of something that can go wrong. So this is a much smaller map, and it looks fine except that if you zoom in, there's all these artifacts. And that's just because there isn't enough resolution in the normal map to compensate for how extreme and tight these little gradients are. Additionally, if you were working with a less than ideal pipeline, uh, we'd want to load up something like this uh, source normal map being rendered in 3ds Max so this no longer matches. You can see that the model on the left looks the worst, and the other two look about the same. So in this case, just using smoothing splits uh, along my existing border edges and then adding a couple extra UV splits uh, was the most efficient way to clean it up, but it's going to come down to a case-by-case -case basis for each part of a model. So at times it'll be more efficient to go in and add an edge loop uh, than adding the split, and at other times it'll be more efficient to add the split. It sort of depends on what's going on in the model. Supporting loops also have the advantage of reducing the number of texture seams. Uh, so if you look at the UVs for this model, um, the one with supporting loops, everything's still one shell, so there's fewer texture seams to deal with, whereas one on the right, I've added a few extra seams. And depending on the kind of model, this may or may not be a big deal. On a hard surface model like this, it's pretty easy to paint around these kinds of seams, whereas if you're doing something more organic like a character, this is going to be a much uh, better approach. So it's not really an either-or. Uh, ideally, you should be using both some supporting loops and hard edges, depending on the circumstance, but I would say that it's definitely good to be using hard edges, at least some, since there are free hard edges to be used from open UV border edges. And I think that a lot of artists who don't use any hard edges currently uh, do so because it can be difficult to bake your models with hard edges and get the projections to work. So in the next section, I'm going to talk about uh, controlling projections and fixing projection distortion.